Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg. I am here today to do my standard Friday Reads video, which I usually do every week. I film a video on Friday and then post it on Saturday. I did not get to do one last weekend and I am sorry. Circumstances just happened. I'm not gonna really go into it too much, but basically we had an appointment with a specialist in Seattle for one of the dogs. It was supposed to be on Sunday, but they called us Thursday night and told us that they had to move the appointment up to Saturday. I'm sure you've all had issues with supply chain and places being staffed enough and due to staffing issues they were not going to be able to have an appointment on Sunday so we had to do it Saturday which meant that Friday I had to do a half day of work, drive to Seattle, didn't get a video filmed in the morning and I had thought to myself maybe when we get there I'll film a quick Friday reads and be done with it. We got there, I was tired and the Wi-Fi in the hotel was down so it just was not going to happen but so that's what happened again i apologize hopefully nobody was really put out by it i don't think anybody would i'm not that important that i could ruin anybody's day but you know i'm sorry because it is a you a regular thing that i do and i know when something is regular interruptions of schedule can be a little weird so thank you for your patience and your understanding in terms of the appointment um I, to be honest with you, I, I don't want, really want to talk about it, so we're not going to go into it too much. We don't actually really have an answer. We have to recheck in December, um, and we will see what happens from that. It's been a wild two weeks because before that, my grandmother died. Uh, it's funny. No, it's not funny. <laughs> Nothing's funny about it. Uh, we were in Colorado for the memorial for Joel's grandmother, and then... Um, found out that my grandmother was not doing well and within 24 hours she had passed. And unfortunately, I was not able to get home to uh, be there for the funeral or for anything like that. But uh, it, so it's just been a, a weird time. And then we went from that to the appointment for one of the dogs with a specialist and the, you know, pandemic is still going. Montana, where I live, is one of the worst states right now. It's got the slowest vaccination rate and uh, just a lot of stuff going on in general. So none of that really matters. We'll get to the Friday Reads portion because I have two weeks of reading to catch up on. To be honest, there's not a whole lot more than usual to cover there because I didn't get any reading done last weekend. And because of rebounding from everything that happened this week, I was pretty slow to get back into the groove of things. But I do have two finished books to talk about, one DNF, and we'll get into all of that when we get into the actual Friday Reads in the latter part of the video. Some things to catch up on that just happened in general. The National Book Awards finalists have been announced. One of the books that I finished was one of those, and I will put a link to the reaction video that I did for the shortlist down below. I think it was a really strong list this year because the two ones of the finalists that I've read were really good, spoiler alert for the Friday Read section of this video, but I think it's a really solid list and I'm excited to explore it a little bit further. The Nobel Prize for Literature was also announced last week and I did manage to film a reaction to that and get it posted because the, the announcement was on Thursday. So I had it filmed, edited, and uploaded before we even got the phone call that we needed to change the appointment in Seattle to Saturday. So I was all prepared for people to be kind of angry in the comment section because my previous two Nobel Prize reactions were basically that a lot of that, like pe people calling me stupid, which usually just gets you an immediate delete because if somebody's gonna name call or curse, I don't engage at all. But there's been a lot of that in the previous two, people talking about like, how could you possibly say this? And just having really bad faith arguments, especially in the one about Peter Hanka's win. So I was really braced for more of that this year. And by and large, all of the comments were supportive. So. Color me surprised. I don't know what happened, but I'm pleasantly surprised. I guess a lot of people really took in sort of the message that I think Abdul Razak Gurna winning the Nobel Prize for Literature is a really good step, but the Nobel Prize Committee, the Swedish Academy, needs to do a lot more. And something I didn't say in the video, but I did say in a lot of comments is that I don't think this is anything that's going to happen, but I think an easy way for the Swedish Academy to fix some of the problems that they've been having would be to open up its ranks and be less insular and allow people from more diverse backgrounds to be part of the decision-making process. I don't know that they will ever do that, but it seems like it's such an obvious way for them to fix their diversity problem. The diversity specifically meaning the winners, but anyway, 
I'm pleased that so many people seemed to agree with the reaction. Again, I will put a link to that one in the description box down below if you have not seen it already or if you are curious. I will also put a link to my October book haul revisit, which I did posted earlier this week. And the only other thing, it's funny, I, I'm just watching myself film this. This t-shirt, every time I wear it, it cuts off here and it looks like the poop emoji. It is not. It is Kurt Vonnegut's face. <laughs> well, it's his hair, specifically. So I feel like I need to point that out. And this is actually my tattered cover hoodie, which I've been living in because it has been very cold in Montana. It's supposed to warm up a little bit over the weekend, but it's been almost full on heading into win winter temperatures. So that's been exciting. I, I actually really don't like the heat, so I don't miss that very much. But it is kind of funny that we almost, we didn't bypass fall because it's not snowing or anything like that. But we kind of went from <laughs> really hot to really cold very quickly. So that's been an interesting progression. And I, one thing I forgot to say about the Nobel Prize for Literature, I checked my local library before I filmed my reaction video and they had only one book of Abdul Razak Gurna's on the list and there were no holds on it at that time but I didn't want to just grab a copy. After I filmed the video I had been thinking about it and decided I was really curious so I looked again and there were I think 15 holds on it so I thought that's good that'll put it out a little bit in the future. I don't need to worry about cramming it in right now so I got on the hold list and the book that my library has available is Gravel Hearts. So it, it also sounds really interesting. And because he is an author that I am really looking forward to exploring, I am hoping that I will get, it'll probably become, I want to say later in the year, but you never know because I had a hold on the love songs of W.E.B. Du Bois and I didn't think it would be coming until later in the year. And I got an email notification yesterday that my hold is available. And that kind of screws my October reading plans because that's a really big book. But my October had already been off to a very slow start because of everything else going on. So maybe it's not such a bad thing anyway. So I haven't really decided what I'm going to do about that. We will figure out <laughs> what's going to happen with that. Now, I'm going to hold on my 3K Q&A question for this week because since I... Actually, let's just get into the Friday Reads portion of the video because I have a bit of a rant and I have a bit of a rave for the two books that I finished over the last two weeks. And I'm really disappointed in the rant. This is the book that I would have been ready to talk about in my Friday Reads last week if I had managed to get a video posted. I finished Fight Night by Miriam Taves, and I didn't like it. And unfortunately, there was a weird flow of events. So. I had requested a copy of this book on NetGalley. I didn't think I was going to get one. And then about a month ago, I got one. So I had actually already read and finished it by the time it was released, but I haven't been able to do like a standalone review of it. So I had already pre-ordered it at the Montana Book Company. So it's this kind of funny, weird flow of events. I had pre-ordered it, was really looking forward to it, and then I got to read it and I didn't like it. But because I had pre-ordered it, I felt like I should see it through and I got the copy. So here it is, and I didn't like it. <laughs> now, if you're unfamiliar, this is the story of a little girl whose name, it's been two weeks since I finished it now, so I want, her name is Swiv. Her grandma is Elvira and she lives, her grandma has come to stay with her and her mother and her mother is pregnant. They call the baby in utero Gordy they don't know the gender of it. It's told from the perspective of Swiv, who is a young girl somewhere around like eight to 10 years old. She has been suspended from school for fighting and she is sort of being homeschooled by her grandmother in a very laissez-faire sort of way. There's not any sort of like appropriate school structure or learning. They are they have like editorial meetings where they will talk about things and there is learning that takes place, but not any kind of academic learning for the most part. And what the book says is that Swiv asks her mother and her grandmother and she will, they write letters to Gordy, but that's a really small part of the book, actually. It's much more about the dynamic between Swiv and her grandmother. And the title comes from the fact that the grandmother, Elvira, is constantly telling Swiv that basically life is a fight and you have to keep fighting all the way through and you're never gonna be done with it. Which is a really interesting message 
So I like that part of the book. Miriam Taves is a very funny writer, and these are very funny characters. They're very eccentric because she loves characters with quirks and eccentricities and things like that. But as the book went on, the quirks seemed to sort of take over, and I didn't really like that. It ended up feeling like it was lacking in emotional heft, despite some pretty heavy things that happen in the book and some pretty heavy content that goes on. And one thing I really like and deeply appreciate about this book is that because Swiv is the narrator, it only makes sense that if your narrator is a child, they wouldn't understand everything that goes on around them. That makes sense. So occasionally a big moment will happen and Swiv doesn't really understand it. She'll make a sort of flippant comment about it. But you, the reader, can sort of fill in the blank. Like, you actually understand the emotional heft of what's going on, especially when there's some sort of interplay between the grandmother and another person or another character, especially the mother. Like, Swiv does not understand what's passing between them, but you, the reader, can can get there. And that's really interesting. I did appreciate that. What's funny thinking about well, it's not really funny, but thinking about it, I've read two Miriam Taves books previous to this, All My Puny Sorrows and Women Talking. Both of those have really emotionally hefty conversations at their core. All My Puny Sorrows is about two sisters, one of whom is suicidal and the other has to figure out how to balance wanting her sister to be alive with her sister's desire not to live, which sounds really depressing. And it kind of is. It's it's a sad book, but it's also a very funny book. And that is kind of the balance that Miriam Taves does the best in. And so it has that really emotional, hefty subject matter that kind of gets you in. And then the quirkiness is there, but because you have such a heavy thing that you're dealing with, it feels a little bit tempered. In Women Talking, there are women in a Mennonite village who find out that they have been drugged and that they are being sexually assaulted in their sleep by the men of their community. So they are meeting in secret to decide whether or not they are going to stay part of their community or if they are going to gather together and leave out into the world where they don't really speak the language, they don't know what they will face. So again, the characters are kind of quirky, there's a lot of humor in there, but it's tempered by this really heavy subject matter. And you don't really have that in Fight Night. So it feels like the opposite ends up happening. The quirks are really center stage and the more dramatic stuff is at a distance. It's sort of at a remove. So I didn't like the result. And the more it got on, the more I felt removed from the book and a little bit irritated, if I'm being honest. The characters make decisions that just do not make sense to me. And I don't really want to talk too much about that part because... It'd be a little bit of a spoiler, but like Swiv and her grandmother take a trip and everything that happens on the trip at a certain point heading into the ending, like the way the trip sets up the climax of the book does not make sense to me. A lot of people make decisions that are just kind of mind boggling at that point. And so you, because I was already kind of irritated with the book at that point, I just completely checked out. And that's a not great place to be with any book, but it's particularly disappointing because of my history with Miriam Taves and how much I really enjoyed All My Puny Sorrows, despite the heaviness of the subject matter, and how much I liked women talking, again, despite really serious subject matter. This one, to me, feels like it's going to be the first Miriam Taves book that I have read that is not going to stay with me at all. In fact, I already feel, I I couldn't remember the (laughs) granddaughter's name. It's only been two weeks. And I think the rest of this is going to fade from my memory as well, because it's there's just no connection to this book, which is a shame. So that's a bit of a rant. It's not a very specific rant, maybe, but because I don't think there's anything problematic. I don't think there's anything really necessarily bad about the book, except maybe some plotting toward the end and the way it feels like the stakes are very low in this book. And maybe Miriam Taves is an author who really needs to have high stakes to balance the tone of her book because it definitely feels off in Fight Night and I didn't really enjoy it much at all. But I can see where somebody else would read it and enjoy it. If you're a diehard Miriam Taves fan, maybe... I haven't read any of her other books. I have a copy of, I think, A Complicated Kindness in my library and uh, I just haven't gotten around to it. So... 
it's possible Miriam Taves fans will like this. Maybe it's a little more similar to some of her previous books, which I haven't read, so I can't say for sure. But it's just not for me. And that's really unfortunate and sad. So that's Fight Night by Miriam Taves. So that is the book that I had finished that I would have talked about in my Friday Reads video last week. I was still working on the audio of Damnation Spring at that point, and I was halfway through uh, Zori by Laird Hunt, but we'll get to that one because now I have finished Zori. I came to a decision about Damnation Spring because I was getting really slowly through the audio of this book because I finally managed to figure out why. And basically, it's about this family, there's the logging industry, there's a lot of environmental subtext in this book, There, are people, the company um, that all the men work for, basically, has been using pesticides nonstop. And there's a lot about that and the impacts that the pesticides are having on the people, but the family at the center has a dog. And it took me a long time to realize that part of why I was getting through it so slowly is that I really don't do well if a with things that happen to dogs and cats in books. And I had a feeling something bad was going to happen to the dog. So I really put a remove to the, put this at a remove and was having a very hard time getting through it or making any progress in it. And I think it's probably understandable why at this particular moment, that in particular was a barrier for entry for me. Like I really couldn't make any progress on this book because I'm worried about my own dog. And this week I said, you know what, just power through. And almost immediately after I started, something happens to the dog. Because at the point last week where I had stopped, there is a mudslide because there are lots of mudslides in the area where the people live because they've been filling all of the trees. So the ground is now unstable around them. So there's a mudslide and it hits the father and the dog. And the language that was used was that the dog was sort of kicking its legs to get out, but it says something about like digging its own grave because it's kicking. They managed to get the dog out in that instance. Hopefully that's not much of a spoiler. But like in my head, it was like, I can't deal with this. So when I picked it back up and something really does happen to the dog, at first I thought, you know, just skip a little bit. So I skipped a couple of minutes ahead and then got to the reaction where the sun comes home and the dog is missing. And I was like, I can't do this right now. So it is a shame because I think this is a great book. I'm just really not at a point right now where I can deal with something very specific that's happening inside. And it's not the book. It's me. It's something really specific. The same thing happened to me, I don't think it was last year, I think it was two years ago, with a book called Christodora. At the time, we were having a bit of uh, an issue, I guess is the word I should say, with our foster son, and Christodora has a lot of stuff about adoption and like biological parents versus people who are taking you in and filling the role of parent. And because of that, I felt like I couldn't get through the book, even though it seemed like it was going to be really great. And that is exactly what was happening with Damnation Spring. So I feel like this is a really good book and I wish I were going to finish it, but I just can't right now. So I am DNFing this for now. Maybe next year I will revisit and come back to it and be in a place where I can finish, but I'm just not there right now. And I hope that makes sense. So I put this to the side and I am going to be starting a different audiobook instead. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Let's first talk about Zori by Laird Hunt. This is my rave. So I got through this really slowly, despite its slim slice, because of everything that was going on. I think I was halfway through by the time I would have filmed my Friday Reads last week. And because this is a library book, it's shiny. Hopefully you can see the cover just fine. I didn't read anything over the weekend, and it took me a couple of days after we got back to pick this back up and get through the last, I think, 70 pages. It's only 161 pages. And I really enjoyed this book. And I think this is going to be the opposite of Fight Night. This is something that is really going to sit with me and that I'm going to be thinking about. And it's funny because it's such a quiet book. And yet it had such a hold on me during the time I was reading it. I just posted about it on Instagram today. And I think what I said there was that it is spare in scope, but epic in scale. And I think that's absolutely true for this book. It seems like a really quiet book, a very small book, a, a very slight book. And yet so much happens in there. What's really funny about this is that the description of the book 
all happens in the first 20 pages, and then it continues on from there. And the description of the book is that the character of the title, Zori, is born in the early 1900s, and her parents die of diphtheria when she is very young, and then her aunt dies as well when she is about 20 years old, and she goes on something of an adventure through Depression-era United States. She is born in Indiana, and she ends up in Ottawa working at a company that uh, has girls like Zori paint illuminated numbers on clock faces using radium. And that is basically the premise of the book, or as much as you get of the book. But that all happens within the first 20 pages. However, that experience, both her parents dying, uh, her aunt dying, and this experience at the uh, radium company working with the other girls has a really profound effect over her life. These are very formative experiences, and the friendships she makes with other girls while she is working at that company will follow throughout her life. It'll be a sort of through line, but it, it's just funny because that's pretty much the plot line, and it's such a small part of the book. It really goes on in different directions from there. I understand for marketing purposes, it's also a really great hook because you have the idea of them using radium to paint the numbers on the clock faces and the fact that they, because they work so closely with the radium, they glow at night. She is nicknamed Ghost Girl by her friends that she makes, and they will occasionally go out in the town, like they will take the radium and draw a little heart on their face, so there will be a glowing heart on their face. They, it's, it's very specific, and this is not a spoiler, because again, it happens in the first 20 pages, but they have to use these paintbrushes to get the radium onto the clocks. And in order to get a really, really fine point, they have to dip the brush in the radium and then put it in their mouth, so they'll get a really fine point. And, Zori only works there briefly, which is why it, that all happens within the first 20 pages, but you see the lasting impacts of what the radium has on these girls over time, because Zori follows her entire life. She lives to be about 70-something, I believe. After leaving the radium plant, Zori ends up back in Indiana. She goes to her hometown, but there's really no place for her anymore. She ends up within the same county, but in a different place. And she does settle down, but her life takes some twists and turns. Nothing really dramatic or anything like that. But you follow her life, and I, I think one of the joys of this book is really seeing what happens to her and seeing where it goes from that plot description that you have, because it ends up being a very different book from what you might expect. I had a, an idea in my head that Laird Hunt is sort of a genre writer because the only book of his I had read before was In the Dark, In the House in the Dark of the Woods, which plays with sort of horror tropes. And I hadn't read anything of his previous work, but now that I've looked at his previous work, it seems much more in line with this than with In the House in the Dark of the Woods. And he really has a masterful control of the language in this book. His prose is very sparse but very effective. It feels like things sort of creep up on you and this sort of mood and tone of the book really settles over you. And by the end of the book, even though it's really short, it packs a really heavy punch. And there are parts of this that really made me stop and think. I'll, I'll, show, I'll read one of them to you. It's from the middle of the book, so it's not that much of a spoiler. It's as they end one of the chapters. It occurred to her then that it was silence and not grief that connected them, that would keep them forever connected, the living and the dead. Her, Noah, Opal, Harold, Janie, Marie, her parents, maybe the whole world, and that this was not such a bad thing, especially if every now and then there was a little Buddy Holly or June Carter Cash playing away off somewhere in the background. And some of the specifics of that sentence... You need to be a little more familiar with the book and the characters, but I love that idea. It's silence and not grief that connected them, that it would keep them forever connected. And it's not such a bad thing. And that is sort of the undertone of this book. It's about Zori's life, and by placing her in the time periods that it does and in the location that it does, it does feel very much like an American story in a really subtle way. I think this could be a really prime candidate for the Pulitzer for next year in the way that if you've ever read Train, G Train Dreams by Dennis Johnson, that was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in 2012, which was the year that there was no award given. 
which it takes this story about a specific time period and it uses that as a lens to tell a sort of quintessentially American stories. Zori is living in the heartland of the United States through sort of quintessentially 20th, 20th century time periods. She experiences the Depression, she experiences World War II, and a lot of things like that, like rock and roll music kind of creeps into it as well, which you can kind of see from that quote. But she's not paying attention to like politics. It's not heavy historical fiction or anything like that. No historical figures show up in the book. But it really settles you into this sort of American idea. And she lives on a farm for most of her life and she works really hard. And through that, you sort of get this idea of like the quintessential Protestant work ethic that America is supposed to be founded on. This idea that just through hunkering down and doing hard work that she will be a good person and a productive part of her community and that she will have everything that she wants. And then you see over time how that sort of pans out. And there, there a lot of these characters have this idea because they're farmers that working hard will get them where they want to be. And yet she has this sort of quiet life. You could call it almost a life of quiet desperation. I don't think that's necessarily fair. It is a little bit. This is a book that's really about silence and grief and the way your life can slip through your fingers in certain ways. Because I love the way time passes in this book. Like something significant will happen. And then it, the way it's described is almost like Zori just kind of blinks and years have passed. And I feel like that's how life can work a lot of the time. Like I, I feel like you sort of don't realize that time is passing in such a big way. And then you find yourself a little bit older and you kind of want you know, once it happens you know, that realization hits you know you will stop and wonder it's like how did i get here how did how did so much time pass how how have i not done so many of the things that i wanted to do and it's not beating you over the head with any of those ideas but they're all there and i think that's one of the other things that i really deeply appreciate about this book it is a finalist for the national book award for fiction for 2021 i I'm a little bit torn because the only other one that I've read is The Prophets by Robert Jones Jr. And I really love that book as well. I think if I were voting right now, I would probably give an edge to The Prophets, but this is really close. And if you ask me tomorrow, I might have a different answer because I think this is a really good book. And like I said, I think it has a really good shot at the Pulitzer because the Pulitzer is supposed to go to an American author, preferably dealing with American life. And I think this hits that in a way that feels very meaningful when you get to the end. And it's such a quiet book and it's such a small book. It's really worth your time. It's only 161 pages and yet it packs so much in. And this has me really curious to go back and read more books of Laird Hunt's. I would absolutely recommend checking this book out as well. I finished it before bed last night. And like I said, I think I'm going to be thinking about this book for a very long time. The cover is interesting. I was looking because the paperback will be coming out in April of next year. And it has a very different cover. I'll put a picture up if I uh, think of it. I think this captures the mood of the book a little bit more. It's a little bit sort of quiet, subdued. I can't quite figure out. It's like in pictures of a barn that are kind of spliced over each other so you don't get the full picture of the barn. And the paperback one doesn't feel tonally right to me. The, the lady in the image feels almost flashy, and that is so not Zori. It's really nobody in the book. So I, 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 this, it's, I don't really talk about covers of books a lot, but I feel like this one captures the tone of the book. But in a way, I just I, I want there to be a better cover that will probably grab more people. I think the paperback cover is designed to pull people in, but this captures the book better in a way. I didn't. I, another thing I forgot to mention is that reading this, I was kind of reminded of Willa Cather and the way she uses kind of spare prose. I've only read My Antonia, which is actually a great book if you have not read it. And I think Laird Hunt really deserves the comparison to that. And if you have read it, I would love to hear what you think. And we'll see what happens with the National Book Award. If it will go to this, if it will go to Matrix. It has really stiff competition. There's Cloud Cuckoo Land, Matrix, The Prophets, and Hell of a Book. And I, I, it, I think this is a much quieter and more subtle book than the other ones, which could work 
against it. People like big flashy things at, at any award show. So it'll be interesting to see what happens over time as we get closer to that. That's what I read. And then when I put down Damnation Spring, I really just wanted something happy to distract myself. So my husband happened to be listening to the audio of The Charm Offensive by Alison Cochran, and he was enjoying it. It was recommended to him by Abby, who works at the Montana Book Company. And he said he was really enjoying it, so I sought it out on Scribd, and I have barely started it. I need to make a little bit more progress over the weekend, but it, I think it's going to be exactly what I need. I'm trying not to know a whole lot about it, actually. I know that it's a gay romance and that it's has something to do with a sort of bachelor-esque reality show. I do not watch The Bachelor, which is my hesitation about this book, but apparently it's really good and Joel has been enjoying it, so I am going to give it a try. And I think that covers everything that's happened in life and uh, my reading life for the last two weeks. So uh, I think that's enough <laughs> for today. I would love to hear what you have been reading, what you've been up to, what you've been watching. If you've been enjoying the great new season of The Great British Bake Off, let me know in the comment section down below. And as always, I really, really, really appreciate your time. I appreciate the nice comments on the Nobel Prize video, the comments that people from people who uh, responded to the post that I made when I realized I wasn't going to be able to do a Friday read to let me know what they had been up to. I really appreciate all of that. And I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.